What is an out-of-body experience? An out-of-body experience is a state of being, a state of awareness, a state of action, uh, separate and apart from the physical body. Now, we've heard about people who have supposedly died and then have come back to life. That is also an out-of-body experience? That is indeed an out-of-body. It's a rather extreme way. I left my body and I was in the universe. Well, I was with God. Instantly zapped out of that body to a body in India. The shamans, Buddhists and yogis have been doing this for hundreds of years. The ancient Egyptians would carve instructions of out-of-body experiences into the rock faces. You know, I'm sitting in the corner of my room watching myself sleep that night. For three days, I was in what I would consider a different dimension. When I came back into my body, I had something that I didn't have before that. I brought something back from that realm. And I felt everything, I knew everything, I knew everything about the world, why I was on planet Earth, why everyone else was on planet Earth. The trajectory of my life was, was radically altered by that experience. When I saw myself separate from my physical body, I realized I'm not limited to it. In fact, maybe there are no limitations. The out-of-body experience stories in this documentary reveal that what lies on the other side is insane. Not only do these stories take people out of their own bodies or across the world through astral projection, but they can also allow experiencers to come back with increased connections to the other side. But first, what is an out-of-body experience? You may have heard of a near-death experience where someone dies and experiences different dimensions, heaven, or the other side. Near-death experiences are types of out-of-body experiences, but here's the thing most people don't know. You don't need to die to have an out-of-body experience. You have had spiritual experiences for a very long time. And I think one of your first notable ones was an out-of-body experience when you were 13. Can you tell me about that? So I had an out-of-body experience when I was 13 years old that lasted three whole days. I interviewed David Masters. David is an author, meditation expert, and self-described dimensional voyager. He has spent over 50,000 hours of his life meditating. That's well over five years. And through that practice, he has been able to access insights most others can't see. In, in each ex aspect of this experience, I was observing my body interacting on a regular daily basis with the people that I lived with, my family, my friends at school. Uh, I would go to school and I would just be up there like a, a helium balloon attached to my wrist, about maybe six or eight feet above me. And I would see myself speaking to my friends and sitting in my classroom. And then I would go home and have dinner. And at the end of the first day, th this was very strange to me. It's like, what happened? You know, I'm sitting in the corner of my room watching myself sleep that night. But I will say this, that there was not a time component in the sense that I sensed time passing. I didn't. It was like a timeless realm that I was kind of tethered to. And so the next day I get up, the same thing happens. And then at the end of the second day, I'm beginning to wonder, how long is this going to last? You know, I, I was outside of myself, although as I was observing all of my interactions with people, I was super aware of myself, um, my, my mannerisms, my speech, the way I walked. I was super aware of everything about myself as well as the people I was coming in contact with and the things I was doing that day. Third day, same thing all over again. The end of the third day, um, up in the corner of my room watching myself sleep. And then the next morning I woke up and I was back in my body. Now, I've, I've coined a phrase for this, and I, I think this is where everything in my life, the, the, trajectory, of my, the trajectory of my life was, was radically altered by that experience. Because for three days, I was in what I would 
consider a different dimension of this world that we live in. Um, Michio Kaku, who is a, a friend of mine, says that it takes between 10 and 11 dimensions for there to be creation. So, you know, I think we're just beginning to discover how many different dimensions that we are interacting with. And when I came back into my body, I had something that I didn't have before that. I brought something back from that realm, that dimension, and I've coined the phrase because since then I've had very prophetic dreams that changed my life, and we'll get to that. Uh, but I ha am terming myself a dimensionaut, like an astronaut. I'm a dimensional voyager. As David mentioned, one thing that can happen to people who have OBEs is that they can come back to their bodies with different abilities. People who have experienced OBEs will tell you that there is no time on the other side. And I wonder if that is why they often come back with insights into what would be the future for us here on Earth. Even after coming back into his body, David was able to have prophetic dreams, including one that was able to save a life. So I, I, I'm, I, I'm going to say I was between 35 and 40 years old. I don't remember exactly because it was a long time ago, but I had a dream in which I saw myself run over and kill my own son. Okay. And every single detail was revealed to me in this dream. Uh, I pull up on like a, a very steep driveway, very short, very steep. And I failed to put my car in park. It was a, a big Cadillac, a two-door Cadillac. I failed to put my car in park. My son's getting out of the back seat behind me and the car rolls out and runs him over. And I wake up from this dream and I'm just sobbing, like uncontrollably. It's like, I just killed my son in this dream. And it was, it, it impacted me so deeply. I couldn't get over it. I just couldn't shake it. It was, you know, it's like seeing something happen in, in actual reality. Okay. Three days later, exactly three days later, the very thing I saw in the dream unfolds, and I was unconscious of, of it happening at the time, right? It was after the fact, I'd sort of, it, it started to, I started to decompress from that dream that I had. But it was a premonition because as it unfolded in actual life, there were, I had family members. I stopped to say hello to some of my family members, pulled up on this steep driveway. There they were. And as I, Forgot to put the car in park. It starts to roll back, but I knew what to do. And I grabbed around behind me and I just grabbed this little boy and I pulled him over to me and the car swung out in the street, but he was in my arms. True story. Witnessed by probably four or five family members. The powerful part of it is, is that so many times people do get in, uh, intuitions or premonitions. I think that the two are often the same. And, but they, they think, oh, that's just a random thought, or in other words, they're not tuned into it as they should be. And so this is the potential for tragedy to be averted. But the bigger tragedy is the domino effect of things that happen after. In other words, because then you said, you say to yourself, why didn't I listen to myself? Right? That's, that happens every day in people's lives. Like, why did I... I knew I shouldn't have, or I knew I should have. It doesn't matter what it is. There's some kind of knowing. There's a there's a sixth sense of being shown, but then we get distracted and the pressures of life start to reform, mold us into whatever it is that those pressures are doing to us. Common themes through these experiences are wisdom, insight, and goodness. And through David's connection to the other side, he was able to access those things and later save his son. Another person who experienced this profound wisdom is Reverend Bill McDonald. In 2010, he was at one of his regular trips to India at an ashram. One day, a guru came to him and told him he needed to get a naughty palm leaf reading done. These readings happened 5,000 years ago when the Indian rishis predicted millions of life patterns of people to come in the future and they wrote them on palm leaves. 
Reverend Bill was very skeptical, but the interpreter was able to tell very specific details about Bill, things that no one there could have known. They go to present day. They told me the next year that I would uh, come, I, uh, I would come back to India and I would uh, go to the Shiva temple in Southern India. And they gave me the name of it and described what it looked like. And there's a hillside there. When I get there, I'm supposed to ignore the temple and just start walking up the hill. Two to four hours, whatever that means, you wander up this hill. And then when you get to the top of the hill, all the rishis, you know, the guys that wrote all these charts, right? All the rishis will be there waiting for you, sitting around a sacred fire. And you won't have to ask any questions because you'll know all the answers already yourself. They just will awaken that in you. And you won't have any questions. You're just going to sit there with them and enjoy whatever it was. And so that was a stupid prediction. I thought, well, that's a really dumb prediction. Okay. So I get to India, and I'm introducing this guru all around India and Mumbai and Pune and these different cities. Big audiences, you know, thousands of people. And I, I, I leave stage and I have a heart attack and I have a major heart attack and I end up going to ER and there I am and I'm told this is pretty serious stuff. You should go back to America and get operated on. So by the time I get to the hospital in California, I walk in and my doctor looks at me and boom, wheelchair, boom. I'm in ER and that's it. I mean, I just went to see my heart doctor and boom. I'm, the next thing you know, I'm in uh, uh, ICU, uh, which is, intensive care unit. I always thought that was kind of funny because I see you and I, I see you too. And the doctors never laugh. Anyway, uh, got to be a dad. It's one of those dad jokes. Anyway, so I'm there for four days in the ICU because I'm not strong enough for them to operate on me. They want to do quadruple bypass surgery on me. And uh, so I, they transfer me to another hospital after four days. And I get there, and then the next morning they say, we're going to operate on you. Okay, so it's 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm taken totally naked. I got a thin sheet wrapped around me. I mean, thin sheet. Put me on a metal table that's ice cold. If you ever been in an operating room, they don't have the temperature warm because they don't want bacteria to grow. So they keep it chilled. You know, I'm, I'm guessing that. Some doctor watching this, tell me your thoughts because I don't know. But it was like, in my, it's like chilled, right? And the doctors all got, they got jackets underneath their their uh, surgery clothes on the top, you know, the gowns. But underneath they got like ski clothes on. I'm going, what? Sweaters? I'm going, what? I mean, it is cold in this room. So the guy's getting ready to, you know, to put me out. And I said, well, can I ask a couple of questions? And he goes, what do you got? I said, well, what are you going to do exactly? So he takes out this scalpel, big old scalpel, looked like a, Straight razor, and you're like, holy cow, right? Says, says, I'm gonna dang demonstrate. So I'm gonna cut your chest open here, and then and then I'm gonna take these and look like pruning shears for a tree, you know, you know, like you know, cutting big branches. He goes, I'm gonna cut your ribs, and then he takes this other thing, he holds it up, and this is a this is a chest uh, expander, and I put this, and it's gonna expand your rib cage out. He says, and then I'm gonna go in there, and I'm gonna do this, that, and then I'm gonna cut your arteries, I'm gonna attach it to this machine. And then I'm going to stop your heart and I'm going to stop your lungs and you'll be on a heart lung machine. Got to pump oxygen into it. And it's going to, and it's going to keep the body well, you know, going. And I go, you're going to stop my heart. You're going to stop my lungs. I'm not breathing. My heart's not beating. He says, yeah, we got to kill you first. Like that was funny, right? And I've got that look, right? And he goes, I oh, don't worry about it. As long as we got electricity, then you're good. Joke, joke. I'm going. Ah, don't worry about it. It, it. it probably won't happen. I mean, this guy's bedside banner is like nothing, right? So I finally make the mistake. I ask him, I said, well, am I going to feel anything? And he says, well, when you're on the heart-lung machine, we have to cut back a, a large amount of the anesthesia we give you because we can't afford to lose you, you know. So it's on that very little anesthesia. And he says, some people, very small, you know, a few percents, you know, two, three, four, five percent, maybe feel anything. That they tell us. So I go, wow, that's wonderful. So they count backwards from 100. And I get to about 96. And I'm 
It's total darkness. And now the rest of the story that you've been waiting for very patiently. Thank you. So now I find myself instantly zapped out of that body, but not into a rainbow body, body of light, an angelic body, a mystical body, a casual body, astral body. No, nothing. I go from that body on the table to a body in India. Me again, except the me in India, because I looked down, because the first thought I had was, do I have clothes on? I looked down and I got clothes on. I'm standing in this this square, you know, this cobblestones, you know, in front of the temple. And I'm going, this is what was predicted I was supposed to be here. But I had the heart attack before I could go there. And now I'm there, right? Because I was getting ready right off that, well, that prediction is not going to ever happen, right? So now I say, oh, and there's a hill. I'm going to walk up that hill. And I'm walking by people. They're bumping into me. I feel them. I feel the sunshine. I feel sweat. I feel the heat. I'm walking. I'm looking at myself. People see me. I see them. There's no illusion of a of a of, a, 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 of any kind of non-body person. I am a body. But my body, the other me, is being operated on the operating table. Because every once in a while, I can feel like hands in my chest. You know, I could kind of there's something going on here. I could kind of feel it here, right? So I go, well, I got nothing better to do. The operation is supposed to take six to eight hours. I might as well walk. So, and there's no time in that dimension where I'm at, right? So it's like, I'll just start walking. So I walk up the hill and I come to a clearing and there's all the rishis. Like there's like 18 or 19 of these guys. And they're all sitting around on logs and rocks and there's a fire. And they just still come sit down, right? So. And it's like, I didn't need no introduction. I knew them all. They all knew me. And then there was one other guy. Remember the, the guru guy that sent me to the uh, get the reading? He was there. He's got his arms folded and he goes, Beer. you can skip a beat once in a while, but don't give up heart. And he kept saying that to me. And I'm going, yeah, okay, fine. I get it. I get it, right? But I, I, I had been in so much pain with this heart attack in particular that I, I was saying, you know, if I get a choice at all, I, I'm not coming back. I mean, uh, this is, uh, I'll let it go. You know, and I got a wife, grandkids, kids, you know, and I'm going, no, you know, I got a lot to live for. But you know what? The pain was just so bad and awful. And uh, so I'm there just enjoying the peace and the bliss of this place. And the guru keeps telling me not to give up, the, you know, skip a beat, don't give up heart. You know, I got to. I got to come back, you know, and all this stuff, you know. And all of a sudden there's clouds. Remember those clouds? Clouds are back. I get clouds on the horizon line. And I hear this voice, feminine, soft, beautiful, female voice. Of course, anytime I've heard the voice of the divine, it's always the divine mother. It's just that spiritual loving voice, uh, very soothing. And maybe that's because it's soothing and it's, Makes you feel comfortable. I don't know. I don't have a theory for that other than the divine voice. I've never heard it other than uh, this beautiful, soft, feminine, powerful voice. And it says, Bill, just give up heart. Let it go. You don't owe anybody anything. You, you don't have any debts. You don't have any karma to pay. Come, just stop breathing. I promise you love, peace, joy, bliss. It's, it's all there. Just come. And then the guru guy keeps interrupting, saying, Bill, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I'm going, well, what are you promising me? He says, I'm promising you more pain than you ever had in your life. He says, up till now, I mean, because I used to go to the dentist and yeah, drill down the nerve. I don't need no shot. Just drill. And the dentist be going. And I'd just be going, you know, do it, man. So I could overcome any pain. 
with mental, spiritual techniques and things I learned from yoga. And he's telling me, no more. Now everything you do is going to have to be learned so you can teach it so a normal person can do it. And I go, what? You're promising me more pain? And he goes, and suffering. And suffering. And she's promising me bliss, joy. What kind of sales pitch is this? You're never going to sell very many cars. Come on. You know, so it just keeps going back and forth and everything. And, and then finally he goes, end, kind of does this. And then that cloud starts filling up with a panorama, a sea of endless faces. Men, women, children, a few dogs, a few cats, a few birds. Black, white, Chinese, Vietnamese, Mexican, uh, French, German, whatever. All these different nationalities. And it's just, and then he tells me, he says, you don't owe these people anything. But they won't get the gift that you're going to give them if you don't come back. And I go, what gifts? Some might just be a smile. Some may might have saved their lives suicidal. Some may have changed their life. They became spiritual. Some may have been healed. Some may need an inspiration. Some just saved a marriage. Some just, you made them smile and laugh. But all these people are waiting for you. If you leave, they will not get that gift. And I go, yeah, but it's going to cost me pain and suffering. Anyway, so then just about the time I'm going through this argument, back on the operating table, they're apparently doing this clear and I'm restarting my heart <coughs> because all of a sudden my body jumps up on that hill and now I'm landed inside of my body on the operating table. And in god-awful pain, I feel everything. I just had quadruple bypass surgery. I'm still open. They started the heart. They just reconnected the artery. And I'm wide awake, except I got my eyes taped, taped shut. I've got a tube down my throat, can't talk. And I'm strapped down. And I'm going, hey, I feel everything. You know, the, the anesthesia just wore off. And then I finally hear the, apparently the, the, the anesthesiologist, uh, anesthesiologist say to the doctor, apparently the surgeon, he goes, hey, doc, he says, uh, it looks like it's worn off. This guy looks like he's feeling everything. And the guy goes, don't worry about it. I only got another 40, 45 minutes to go. We'll close him up. And I'm going, 45 minutes? 45 minutes? I'm going, and I can feel everything. The staples, you know, wiring together the rib cage, you know, stapling and stitching and doing all this stuff. And I could feel everything. So I was promised more pain and suffering and it started as soon as I was on the operating table again. Boom. This near-death experience resulted in a profound journey of astral projection. This experience was able to give Reverend Bill insight into the good he could do on Earth still. For Bill though, this wasn't his first spiritual experience. He had many before and after this. And it seems as though once you are able to achieve an out-of-body experience, it is more and more possible to have another. OPE experiencer Deb Carr echoes this idea. When I spoke to her, she first told me about an NDE where she accessed this otherworldly dimension. And then she related that to how she was able to re-access other dimensions with OBEs. Now this happened around about 30, over 30 years ago or 30 years. So, but just to bring things into context, I've had a lot of operations and general anesthetics in my life. So I think it's around 20. So I've had a lot of them. The most recent one was maybe 18 months ago when I fell down the stairs and I slashed my arm open and had to have that surgically re repaired. And about four years ago, I had major surgery, emergency surgery, where I was under for a long time and um, it saved my life. So I've had a lot of operations. But this particular event happened in one about 30 years ago, and it's never, ever happened to me in any of the other anaesthetics I've had. And when I was in the anaesthetic, I left my body and I was in the universe. And, well, I was with God and I couldn't see God. I couldn't see anything like that. But I could see all the stars and I could see just the universe and I was part of it. And I was part of God, or I guess you would say these days, divine energy. And I felt everything. I knew everything. I knew everything about the world, why I was on planet Earth, why everyone else was on planet Earth, 
everything I knew and I heard this sort of, I could see this sort of construction going on, like uh, some sort of building blocks is all I can say. And I could hear this tick, 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 tick noise to go with it. Like it was like, I don't know what it was. But then, I, so I knew everything and then I was told I'm, I'm coming back, but I would know that I knew, but I wouldn't remember what I knew because if I knew, if I remembered, I'd cheat and <laughs> I wouldn't do my life my life work. Deb has had numerous out-of-body experiences and has even been able to anticipate them ahead of time. I've had numerous body, out-of-body experiences. I always know when they're going to happen because I get this whirring sound in my head right here and it, my, it's like a vibrating and then my whole body sort of, I how do you explain body vibe, it's just shaking and then I'm out. But I've never been able to go further than my room, which is probably a good thing because, you know, who knows where I'd end up. So that's what happens to me. And then when I come back in, sometimes my body is just shaking and for the rest of the day I'm exhausted. Like, yeah, and I have to tried intentionally when I'm out of my body to move further, but I just haven't been able to do it. And I think the, the reason is maybe a bit of fear stops me. The, the last time I had it had actually once it happened when my daughter was very young. She was about four, and she was six. So I was in bed with her one morning, and all of a sudden I started to leave my body. And Emma actually sat up and reached out and said, "No, Mum, stop!" And that that was crazy. Like she must have been in a sort of a twilight as well. But yeah, that, that I've had them, and they I I can't make them happen. They just happen. At times, yeah. Wow. Do you know, do you have any guesses as to why they happen? Probably my soul wanting to know those answers that I had in my NDE, you know, <laughs> trying to find out more. Because I, tr- I, because I do believe so strongly that there is more to our body, that we are infinite, indestructible energy. And I think I, think I chose a, a life that I that I, I'm always going to be wanting to go back and find out what's going on, you know. I'm just inquisitive, like, that's what I think it is. Like, my body, my soul just wants to explore. NDEs have given me a purpose in life. To me, it's made me motivated. It keeps me going. Not that I've got a bad life. I've a pretty cool life, really. But it's just, it, it gives me hope because I've got the faith that, especially the way the world is at the moment like I think I've never I'm 62 years of age and I've never seen the world like it is at the moment it's it's, it's bonkers and I think it gives me hope and that that there is it we are going to evolve human humans are going to evolve into something way better than we are behaving at the moment um so I've always always wanted to know why why am I here? What's going on? And why, why um, human behavior, why are so many people so ego driven and not very pleasant, whereas others are just angels, you know? It's just, I think it's, it's a crazy place to be on planet Earth. It's, it's interesting, very interesting. What would you tell to people who have doubts about NDEs? I would tell them to hop onto YouTube and watch all the videos or go onto the, you know, NDERF dot org website and read them and just have an open mind and and think about it why why would all these millions of people come back and say this and m- many of them don't want to talk about it because they have a, a career and they don't want to ruin their reputation they don't want to be thought of as crazy you know i don't care people can say what they want about me i know what happens to me so it's my business and no one else's <laughs> So, yeah, I think just have an open mind and, you know, one day it might happen to you and then you'll know, won't you? So Deb has had many spiritual experiences, but the most meaningful ones have included her brother who passed away. I find the one she is about to share so interesting because instead of Deb being out of body, her brother comes to her in his earthly body. Instances like this just further prove to me that there is so much more to our bodies, souls, and experiences than one might think. So it was 
1997 when Gary took his life and he and I were very, very close together, so close, at, especially at the end of his years. I was his rock. And um, after I found out that he had had um, passed away, I was a complete mess. I still am. <laughs> and um, three days after he died, I was lying in my bed, sobbing my, sobbing my eyes out. I was by myself. And all of a sudden, I heard his voice clear as day right here next to this ear. Deb, I'm okay. And I was like, I was like, Gary. <laughs> and um, then I got a vision. So I'm, I'm quite intuitive and do have third eye experiences sometimes. But this vision was right here, in, right here in my third eye. And I'm on, this, on a, a concrete bench crying. I don't know why I'm on a concrete bench. And I'm, I'm like this, crying over him. And he came up to me and he was wearing a jumper, what sweater you guys might call it, and it had diamonds on it. They were black and white, something I, I hadn't seen him wear that before. He was wearing black jeans. He had very scruffy hair because he was a scruffy person. <laughs> and he came up to me in the, and he put his arm around me. He winked at me and he said, Deb, everything you believe in life after death is true. I'm really, really happy. Now, that was a long time ago, as I said, he died in, uh, sorry, it was 1998 he died in November. And I remember that so clearly and I can still hear his voice so clearly. And that gave me a lot of hope to to know that he was okay. And because I worried, you know, growing up a Catholic, we're taught that if you take your own life, you, you're going down to the fire pits. But um, I don't believe that. He's, he's in a good space. And he's come to me a few times in different dream that I've woken up in fact one dream I remember being with him and, and I was crying in the dream and when I woke up my whole pillow was saturated with tears and then um, I had this reading with a guy called a psychic reading at the time he was called psychic oranges I'm not sure if he's still around his name was Michael Wheeler and I'll never forget his name because he really helped me a lot and he Gave me this reading over the phone. He didn't know who I was, didn't know anything about me. And he started telling me things about my mother who had three dogs that started with the letter B and they'd all passed over. And I, hmm, how does he know that? And then he said, oh, your, your brother, you used to play the guitar and uh, all stuff like that. But then he said to me, oh, your brother wants you to know. He wants you to know he loves the tattoo. He loves the tattoo of the feather. He said it exactly like that. Three weeks prior to that, I got a tiny little feather tattooed on my back in memorial of my brother Gary. And then, this is, a, this is really going to sound really strange, but this really happened. Then he said, you're going to get a present in the post and you'll know it's from your brother. And I just went, okay, this is ridiculous. This has not happened. Three weeks later, I get a present in the post and it's a feather and I used to find feathers all the time green and, and blue feathers and feathers and that made me feel in touch with Gary and it was this feather and it was encased in a, 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 a frame and it had a poem on it and the poem was an angel is looking down upon you and they want you to know that I can't remember all the words and I just just w looked at this and I went how can this be? Like, how, how? And what happened was a lady had sent it to me. She had found me on one of my blogs when I'd spoken about my brother's death because she had her little girl had passed away, a five-year-old, and I thought she, uh, she sought me out for some sort of comfort and we were talking. And she said, I just walked into a shop and all of a sudden I was guided to this feather and I had to send it to you. And, you know, I can't explain it, but it was very weird. So, Deb personally associates feathers with her brother. Then, she is told by a stranger that her brother likes her feather tattoo and that she's going to get a gift from her brother soon. And then, a separate person with no prior knowledge of this has an intuition to send Deb that gift. This is such a powerful experience because it is proof that these cannot simply just be dreams or coincidences. These experiences have to be real.
The channel that you're watching this video on right now is one dedicated to sharing stories about near-death experiences. I wanted to make this documentary not only on those near-death experiences, but also out-of-body experiences because one, they also encapsulate NDEs, and two, I think it is so powerful that one can receive wisdom and insights that are similar to NDEs without actually having to die. And in fact, there are three different types of out-of-body experiences. Evolutionary OBEs happened at a crossroads in their life. They needed to make a decision. They were emotional about something. They felt stuck in some kind of way. And so my theory is that an evolutionary OBE happens when the psyche, psyche Greek word for soul, um, needs to shift and self-actualize. And so it's almost like the psyche makes a spontaneous out-of-body experience happen so that it can self-actualize into existence a new sense of self and open a new pathway into that reality that reflects that self. This is what we call an evolutionary out-of-body experience, and this is what I teach in the quest. The second one is provoked. Who here has had a near-death experience, show of hands? More people than I thought. I'm nodding like this, and I'm actually getting shivers at the moment looking at you because I know, I know, uh, I know the, what the experience can, how it can impact you. It's, it, it, it is radical. It's life-changing. So a provoked out-of-body experience, we call these forced ones, is when the body or the mind becomes compromised in some way. Either it becomes injured and you have a near-death experience or through fear. Charlie, who just gave the talk now, he, when he first started speaking, used to get stage fright. And one time in his early talks, he got stage fright and he came out of his body. He went, saw everything for a few moments, was whoa, and dropped back down. And so you can have them from a panic attack or as a side effect, as a coping mechanism to deal with what, you're, what situation you're in. And then self-initiated. This is what we are going to learn on Friday at my workshop, two till four. Self-initiated means it happens willingly. We use our intention to have one. This is out-of-body experience and astral projection expert, Jade Shaw. After a life-changing OBE, she pivoted her career and pursued a master's of science in transpersonal psychology with a focus on these types of experiences. During her degree, she found these insights. How were they before? How are they different? And how does that impact the psyche? And I found seven common themes. These were decreased fear of death. This was number one. If there was one biggie, this is number one. A complete decreased fear of death. If not, no fear of death at all. There was less anxiety, more inner peace, a change of relationships. People let go of toxic relationships and found new ones. They felt more spiritually connected, had an increased sense of individuality. This is interesting because often you have a sense of interconnectedness, serenity, oneness. And paradoxically, that made people feel a sense of their individuality. And then there was a greater self-awareness and a radical new life view. This radical new life view was the biggie. This was the big one because it changed, like me, the course of my life. The shamans, Buddhists, and yogis have been doing this for hundreds of years. The ancient Egyptians would carve instructions of out-of-body experiences into the rock faces of temple walls. The Greeks would practice or do astral projection in the mysterious Elysian rituals that they would use to initiate the highest order of people. And there was this anthropological study that looked at this around the world. They looked at 60 cultures and they said, okay, out of these 60 cultures, 90% said, yeah, we've heard of out-of-body experiences, it's the thing. Out of that 90%, 46% said, yeah, and we have a practice for it. We do this so that we can leave our body and go across the Himalayan mountains to get to teachings from our masters at the other end of the country that we can't get to in body. And we bring that information back to our community. We do this to go find where the buffalo have gone, where the herds have gone, so we can come back to our body and tell the hunters where to go and hunt the next day. 
We do this so we can manifest things into existence, receive guidance, and help others. We do this so that at the point of death, we can meet the end of our life, not only with no fear, but with joy. Many people think of OBEs as a niche hobby that may or may not be real, and if it is real, only certain people with special abilities can access them. However, Jade's research on OBEs proves that this is more widespread across history and cultures than some may think. Another group that looked into utilizing OBEs and astral projection was the CIA. Many of the documents of the, their investigation into this are now publicly available on their website. And the mission statement, declassified in 1999, was to establish a program using psychoenergies for intelligence applications, specifically utilizing that field of psychoenergetics referred to as remote viewing. And of course, the CIA caught wind of it, didn't they? They were like, oh, why? What's going on here? They're doing all of these crazy shit. Let's see if we can do it. Let's see if it's real. So the CIA went and practiced this in the late 1970s to the early 80s. They sent a team of their agents over to the Monroe Institute, which is the world's largest institute for out-of-body experiences. In fact, we partnered with them to make the tracks for the quest. So the stuff that you hear on there, the hemisync, uh, the binaural beats, was produced by the Monroe Institute. The they went over there, the CIA, and they wrote a report. This is what they said in the report. The out-of-body state may be regarded as an extremely effective way to accelerate the process of enhancing consciousness and of interfacing with dimensions beyond time space. All of Jade Shaw's research is very interesting, but what I find most impactful is what she says about why these experiences are important. Perhaps it isn't until after you have an OBE that you realize that so many of life's challenges are confined to the physical body. And once you are able to let that go, you can accept freedom and peace. When I saw myself separate from my physical body, I realized I'm not limited to it. And if I'm not limited to my physical body, maybe there are other areas of my life that I'm not limited to either. In fact, maybe there are no limitations, only possibilities. And I realized, oh my God, so much suffering is attached to the physical body. Think about it. Sexism, racism, homophobia. When the physical body is injured, we suffer. When our sense of self is insulted, we suffer, and it's because this is all we think we are, a body and a mind. When we have an out-of-body experience, we have direct proof that we are more than matter, more than mind, more than our limited sense of self. And this knowing can change everything. Every single person in this room can do that, can astral project, can leave their physical body. So how can someone get started with this practice? For each person, the process is often unique and some people may have a much easier time connecting to the other side than others. If you're just getting started learning about this, the first step is to create peace in your mind and take control over your thought processes. Believe it or not, it is so utterly and completely simple so I was invited to speak to a group of um, workers at an Amazon facility. There was 1,500 people. They'll give you 15 minutes. You got to identify the problem and the solution, seven minutes each, right? The problem is we're all reacting to the outside world all the time. And the more we go into our mind and our brain to look for the answers that haven't worked yet, the more difficult it becomes to find the answers that haven't occurred to you. Okay, so that's the problem. There are answers already waiting for you. So what it is that it was shown to me, this idea of what I call the pink elephant. And I'm, I teach it to everybody I meet. Okay. And so if anybody's, you know, 
doing something, <laughs> driving a car, I would say, please just pull over and just give yourself a moment because this only takes 30 seconds. And here's what I teach people. And it's a very simplified meditation technique. Close your eyes and imagine a pink elephant. I don't care what the elephant looks like. Just imagine that pink elephant. Okay. Now, you see the pink elephant? Yes, I see the pink elephant. Okay, now I want you to focus your conscious awareness from that mental image down into your either hand or both. Just give that energy down into your hand for just a moment and begin with your thumb. Just focus on your thumb. Give it a little bit of your attention until you feel the tip of your thumb, your thumb start to tingle. Now shift it to your next finger. And when that you feel it getting a little bit warm, a little bit tingly, it's not an effort thing. It's a giving thing. You're giving your attention. Now give it to the next finger and just be aware of it. And don't force your attention. And your finger will begin to tingle a little bit. That's you've achieved it. Now go to your next finger and then to your pinky. Now what happened to the pink elephant? Oh, I forgot about it. It's gone. Yeah. And this is how you vanquish every single problem without any effort. All you're doing is redirecting the force of your conscious mind. Your conscious mind is so powerful. Your conscious mind is more powerful than any supercomputer. And I'll tell you why. And this is what I discovered when I was 13 years old. When I went into that alternative space and I brought something back with me from that space, what I realized was that, that you, you, when you access the now moment, everything is there. Everything. In other words, in the now moment, there are no limitations on what you can be shown or what you can see and what can be revealed to you. And most people do not know how to stay in the moment long enough to receive those revelations. And, and the, a revelation is nothing more than something that's revealed. I have dreams. I write books about my dreams. Uh, another book that I recently wrote is called Not of This World, in which I saw metaphysical, also known as spiritual energies being exchanged through a very thin cellophane veil. In other words, what, di what divides us from higher knowing is, is infinitesimally small and thin. But the energies of our lives are constantly transferring between the spiritual realms and the physical realms. Constant. And what the way I describe that is, you know the stuff in a lava lamp? The stuff that moves up and down? This is what it, it was shown to me in this dream, that this, this, this is the energy that is exchanged between dimensions. So when you, when you do something that you should do, there's an energy exchanged into, into the next realm. And when you do something you shouldn't do, there's an energy exchanged into that from you into those realms and those realms into you. I have a person that I'm working with who has, a, this person said to me, I don't like being alone because I'm afraid of my thoughts. And I, I thought that was a very honest and powerful admission because clearly those thoughts are there throwing little darts. You're not worth it. You, you, nobody wants you. You, you know, the typical thoughts that make you feel like life isn't worth living. And so I said to her, pink elephant, see, dissolve those thoughts by observing them. And because what happens is, and I said to her, and this is important, when you get quiet for a few moments, you begin to pry open a cosmic doorway through which knowing, new knowing, now knowing, enters you. And once it enters you, it's an accumulative effect, like sands in the hourglass. When the now knowing comes into you, it changes you and it cannot be driven out. That's a little bit of light. If you're in a cave and you have no light, then you have to feel your way. and You can't see anything, but a tiny little match can illuminate an entire cave and gives you potential for a direction that you never would have known to go. David talks a lot about the importance of meditation and how this quiet can guide us towards our intuition. This is another crucial lesson many spiritual people will tell you. 
you have to listen to your intuition. David learned this lesson when he was 17 and almost drowned. He was planning on surfing and was just about to go out when he heard something say to him, don't go out today. He didn't listen and then heard again, don't go out today. At 17, he said back to the voice, who are you to tell me what I can and cannot do? When he was surfing, he had an accident and punctured his lung and barely survived getting out of the water. Now he says he thinks that this voice, this intuition was his angels looking out for him. Uh, I started meditating after I had that ex accident uh, when I was 17 where I almost drowned. I realized, I mean, it's like, I'm not really paying attention. I'm not, yeah, I get little glimpses of it, but what if there's a lot more for me to be aware of that could potentially change the many courses of my life, right? And so that's when I started meditating. I've been meditating now for 53 years. And the more you meditate, the more you become a vessel for those little accumulations. Of the, I call them like lights, sand of light. And, and oh, this is another thing that happened to me. After I started meditating when I was 17 years old, nothing, I was like, felt I was in a dark cave, right? And that's kind of like that, that uh, pink elephant meditation. I just became aware and anchored myself in the now moment. And a year went by. I would sit and meditate every day, sometimes an hour, two hours. I would meditate, try to, try to let go of all the thoughts. Nothing. It was just black, like a, a black cave. At the year, end of a year, I see a little tiny, tiny pinprick of light at the end of what seemed to be a tunnel. Close my eyes. There's a little tiny pinprick of light. Okay, I said, this is maybe this is progress. Two years. The light got a little bit bigger. You see, three years, it got bigger. Four years, I see the end of the opening in the end of the cave. Five years. One day, I'm meditating. I'm focusing in the now moment. I come out of that cave of my mind. And you know the, the um, code in the Matrix movie? The trickling code that trickles down the screen? This was white code trickling down wherever it is that I emerged from into, into that realm. And so I was uh, 23, almost 24 years old when that happened. But what I realized at that moment was, this is when my real life begins. This was all just a, uh, it was a, a prep session that lasted me 24 years to get me ready to come out into and emerge into the next phase of my life. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to take that long for everybody because I was a very selfish kid. I was selfish. I got angry at angels. Come on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Who the hell are you to tell me what to do? It's like, I, I had, I had, you know, I had an attitude problem. I'll just, I'll just do this meditation with you real quick. And please don't do this in your car or if you're driving or whatever. You close your eyes. You become aware of this space right in the middle of your forehead. This is the pineal gland. This is a stimulating the pineal gland, which is the master gland of the body. You become aware and you look out into what appears to be space in the middle of your forehead. Don't use your eyes. Just become aware of that space in the middle of your forehead. And you can then begin to see, and this is a little bit of visualization, that you could see the back of your hand. It doesn't make any difference which hand. Become aware and see the back of your hand. And now flow the attention that you have while you're remaining aware of that image of the back of your hand down your arm. Give your energy. Don't force it, but give it. It's a whole different dynamic involved in giving attention because you don't use your will. You use and you flex the muscle of your conscious mind to flow that energy down your arm, into your hand. And as you can see your hand, you can become aware of your thumb, as I described before. And you become aware of it until it becomes a little bit warm and tingly. Now you've focused on your thumb. Now go to the next finger. And you go to the next finger. And each one of them in turn will become a little bit warm and a little bit tingly and 
This is what allows new programming because you're what you're doing is you're scrubbing your hard drive. You're getting rid of all the old stuff. You're releasing all the old stuff and you're making room for the new. And that's as easy as it gets. There's no incantations. There's no mantras. It's just focus your energy in the now moment. And you have now energy. And now is forever energy. It's forever. It is timeless. And it transports you out of the realm that you've been trapped in. This is in my book, uh, How to Escape the Prison for Your Mind. You don't need bars on your mind for you to be in prison if your mind is in prison. And in a sense, we're all born into cultural prisons. This is what divides human beings, our cultures. We have different cultures. We have different beliefs about many of the same things. And so that, that has to be, some, at some point in time, the world has to agree on certain things. See, we have to shed this old skin that we've lived in and take on the now skin. And the now skin is a forever skin. And so even as your body gets older, uh, you become more at peace within. You have true inner peace and you have more of a connection with the great beyond, the creator. If you've had an experience with an OBE, please tell me about it in the comments. I'm so curious to hear more. And thank you so much to David Masters, Reverend Bill McDonald, Deb Carr, and Mind Valley, and Jade Shaw. I've included any relevant links in the description, including the link to where you can learn more about David's many books and Jade's course. My name is Lauren, and this year I've been interviewing people with near-death and out-of-body experiences, and it's changed my life. If you want to learn more with me, make sure you subscribe to this channel. Thank you so much. And that night I woke up again at one o'clock in the morning, and there he was standing at my bed again. And I said, no, 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 no. Last time you were here, no, 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 no. I don't want to, I don't want this. I don't want to die. I don't want to be sick. And he just stared at me, didn't say a word. And so I took a breath and I thought, ah, this isn't gonna go away. And I felt inside of me saying, okay, all right. And he just did this, he just reached his hand out. And when I went to touch it, boom, we immediately started flying. And we were flying through the air. And as we came down, I could see that we were actually coming down right at my ranch right in the middle of my ranch. And it's like one of those silly dreams that you have when you're flying and then suddenly you're walking fast to stop. And we both do that. And this spirit is walking in front of me and he's picking these things out of the ground, these black spikes it looked like. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, these are still energetic remnants from past civilizations that are in the earth that I'm clearing because this is a sacred ground that needs to be reinvigorated. I said, okay, and I'm still just following behind him as we're walking, and I said, by the way, what's going on? And, and who are you? And he said, you can call me father. And I thought, well, mm, 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 yeah. Um, and I thought, well, my father's dead, but you're not, well, maybe it's another father from another lifetime. I, I really, you know, it's so going so fast, and, and we walk a little further and I can see on the left, there's a, a campfire, a huge campfire with a dozen ancient Native Americans just around it. And he walks up to it and he turns to me and he says, you have to understand that um, we're going to teach you and we're going to uh, train you in how to be one of us. And I thought, okay, but I don't even know who or what. And, and the short of it is for the next 13 nights, every night he came to me, he put his hand out. We flew to the same spot of the ranch. The other 12 el elders met us. And for a couple hours every night, they sort of downloaded me. I don't know how else to, to describe it. Giving me this information, teaching me about ancient wisdom. And with it, they gave me a chapter of a book that they wanted me to write. And it was 13 nights and 13 chapters. And after the third night, because the, the father would give me the chapter first, he would kind of give me the information and I felt it, it was almost like a, a seed that just came into me and it had all of the information in it. And I would suspend it while I would go through this education with the ancients every night. And after the third night, I started to get really sick, really sick, where I was talking to my wife again. I said, you know, I'm, I don't know what we're gonna do. 
I don't know if I'm going to make it. I said, I can't go through these dying experiences. I'm, and so that night when Father came, he said, look, um, we recognize that the physical body is not holding up to what we thought it would. So he created literally a seed and it looked like this monster Easter egg. And he said, at the end of each night, I'm going to give this to you and in it is the chapter. And that way you don't have to hold it in you while we go through the lessons. And when he put it in my hands, you could see the top had this incredible seam to it. This incredible white light was coming out of the seam. And when you moved your hands up, it opened up like a flower and the words just came tumbling into me. And it was uh, that chapter of that thing. And so at the end of the two to three hours every night, I would wake up, I would go downstairs and I would write out what was the chapter in, in the book.